Well, hey folks, how you doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome to my porch. So glad to have you with us. Beautiful fall day, a little bit of crispness in the air. I love it, love sitting on the porch. I love talking with you while I'm on the porch. You're gonna hear some loud noises. Remember, we're at my old cabin with the tin roof. Got some huge white oak trees around us, and as you outdoorsmen know, they make some pretty big acorns, and it will sound like gunshots when those acorns hit this tin roof. And I may jump a little bit, but it's okay. So just be aware when you hear the loud noises, what they are. Adds a little bit of ambiance to our porch. There it goes right there. So at any rate, we're just so glad to have you with us. We have been involved in this series entitled Get Ready Now for many weeks, just having some conversations about what Jesus teaches on the Tuesday before he's crucified on Friday called the Olivet Discourse. Best overview of the last days that you get anywhere. And Jesus knew that we could fill in the details with the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. He knew his disciples could fill in the details with the book of Daniel. And so as we walk through this together, we've looked at verses 1 through 3 of Matthew 24, where Jesus said God's plan for the ages is right on track. And then verses 4 through 14 he gave us the ten signs of his return. And tucked right into the middle of that, he told us the parable of the fig tree. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. And the parable of the fig tree would have caused the disciples immediately to think about the seven parables that Jesus taught in Matthew 13 regarding the end of the age. And he talked specifically in those parables about the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what he would say when he introduced the parables. And he was referring basically to that which represented heaven on earth, the church. Because in those parables he talks about the extraction of evil from the church or from that entity, the kingdom of heaven. And we know there is no evil in heaven as we know it. And so it was that which represented the church or the, the kingdom of heaven on earth known as the church. Now, Jesus said something really interesting in Matthew 24. He, he said, if you want to know the ten signs of my return, that means you're approaching the time when I'm going to return. Look at the world around you. And you can see it in everything around you, from the natural disasters that are occurring, to famines that will take place, even to pandemics like COVID-19. Then Jesus said, hear the parable of the fig tree. And in Luke 21, it was the parable of the trees that indicated the season of his coming. And so in the season of his coming, Jesus said, when he's right at the portal, right, just getting ready to burst forth into the world, you can see the seven marks of his return in the church. The ten signs of his return in the world around us, the seven marks of his return in the church. And then he concluded this Matthew 24 teaching by talking about the culture, and the trends that you could see in the culture. And as I said last time, this is kind of the apex of what Jesus has been teaching. Because in this apex, you see the two trends that Jesus identifies that is absolutely going to be dominant as you prepare for His return and for the extraction of His church. In fact, He says the first trend will be globalization. That globalization that will take place. We're already there, and, and, and it, has, it is killing the normal that we have ever known. In fact, that's being accelerated by COVID-19. We saw two aspects of this globalization last, uh, the time before last when we talked. First of all, it's political. And Jesus talked about the abomination of desolations. When fake Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth, demands that everybody worships him, and that it will be enforced by commercial control or through the economy. And... Anyone that wants to buy or sell is going to have to have the mark of fake Jesus to do that. And so that first, that first trend of globalization is already taking place. We talked in detail about how we have electronic fund transfers now and everything's occurring so that all of these transfers are taking place and everything's occurring so that we're, we've become a globalized economy. We actually have. But it's the second trend that really puts the exclamation point on everything that Jesus is saying. And Jesus says the second trend is the worldview that will dominate the culture 
in the season of His coming. It is the way of looking at the world. Jesus says that the second trend is relativism. Now, what, what does relativism mean? It means that my opinion is what shapes the morals, the standards, the guidelines, the decisions that I have, that I make. And so it's my opinion may not be the same as your opinion, but truth is all, everything is relative to my experience. And Jesus identified five areas where relativism will become dominant. And we looked at three of them last time, and then we conclude with the last two this time. Uh, the first one that we saw, if you'll remember, was that Jesus said this relativism would dominate in the area of truth so that there is no such thing as absolute truth anymore. And, and, and we cited um, Barna's study that currently 91% of American adults do not believe in the existence of absolute truth. That, I mean, that's astounding to me. And here's the, the other thing that's astounding. 75% of Christians in church don't believe in the existence of absolute truth. And so there you go. I told you they'd be here. And so what that means is that man's opinion and his selfishness is elevated above absolute truth. But then the second area Jesus said relativism would be evident in is not only the area of truth, but also in the area of war. In other words, if my opinion clashes with your opinion, and my opinion is just as valid as your opinion, then certainly we can, you know, I can defend my opinion. Jesus said it another way. He said, as one of the signs of his return, that nation would rise against nation. Uh, ethnos is the word in the original language from which we get our word ethnicity. In other words, there would be racial violence. And kingdom would rise against kingdom, meaning that there would be war between nations. And at, last time we saw that, as Paul said, people would be saying that there would be peace and security, as they were saying when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, but there would come a sudden explosion of violence, which we've seen in our world. We currently have more armed conflicts per year in the world than at any other time in human history. And so this area of relativism, this trend, can be seen in the area of truth, in the area of war, and then finally we said in the area of the environment. In other words, God would not be honored as the creator. And in fact, what would happen is man would assume responsibility for the environment. And you see that happening. What's the politically correct view today? Is that we're experiencing global warming and it is caused by man's pollution. We are experiencing global warming. But even if man quit polluting today, global warming would continue. And so then what happens in the age of relativism is man thinks he controls the environment and that he has the power and the authority to affect the environment. Nothing could be more foolish. And so just as you need the Lord's involvement in your life to know your purpose, we are watching creation convulse because of the sin and decay that has been introduced into creation by man's rebellion against God. But Jesus is coming, and when He returns, He will fix that. He will fix creation. And so we see this trend of relativism as the thread that is woven among the signs of the return of Jesus, the marks of living in the season of His coming, and as the epitome of the, the understanding that we're living right on the verge of the return of Jesus. And that brings us to the second, final two areas that Jesus says we will be able to see this relativism. And these two areas, I believe with all my heart, are the apex of what Jesus has been teaching. There's the area of truth in which relativism will be seen, the area of war, the area of the environment, and then number four, there is the area of the church. Matthew 24 verse 32 he says from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near and so also when you see all these things you know that he is near at the very gate 
Jesus tells the parable of the trees. We know from Luke 21, he, he not only identifies the fig tree, but all trees, to recognize the, the marks of a, of a season. And Jesus is referring to the season of his coming. And in doing so, Jesus is saying, when you see these marks occurring, you know that I'm right at the portal. I'm getting ready to burst forth into this world. So you better get ready. I'm at the gate, Jesus is saying. And when the disciples heard this parable, remember that they would have immediately been reminded of the teaching that Jesus did in Matthew 13 of the seven parables that gave the seven marks of the return of Jesus that was seen in his church. Jesus shows us that this trend of relativism will invade the church and that man's opinion will not only be elevated above truth, but will also be elevated above God's Word. In fact, in the seven parables, here's your principle, that illustrate the seven marks of living in the season of His return, Jesus shows how relativism will invade the church and what He will do about it. First of all, there was the parable of the sower, which told us that God's Word would be refused. The hard-hearted, the shallow-hearted, the preoccupied will refuse to allow God's Word to take root in their lives. And so we know that three-fourths of the people, basically, Jesus says, will embrace relativism and selfishness instead of God's Word to shape their lives. Jesus says, sow the Word anyway. Then in the second parable, the parable of the weeds or the parable of the wheat and the tares, we see God's Word dishonored. In other words, lost and saved people together will belong to the church. That will be the scandal of the church and how relativism has ultimately moved on the church in the season of the return of Jesus. Number three is the parable of the mustard seed, which showed us God's word altered. Relativism will invade the church, causing God's word to lose its pungent, penetrating nature because it won't be taught in the church anymore. The church will take on wooden structures of the culture and it will change God's Word into religion. And then in the fourth parable, the parable of the leaven, we see God's Word ignored. God's Word ignored. As a result of the lost joining the church in the season of return of Jesus, man's opinion, not God's Word, shapes and molds the church. And so the culture becomes the dominant force spreading evil like leaven or yeast in bread. In short, God's Word is replaced with man's opinion in the relativistic world of the season of the return of Jesus. But you know, Jesus did not leave us to this relativistic world. Let me tell you what He did while He was teaching those parables to His disciples and to the crowd. He withdrew from the crowd. And He told His disciples and us what He's going to do about this relativism that will invade His church. He taught the three remaining parables of Matthew 13 regarding what we could cling to in this relativistic age. Jesus tells us, here's your principle, what He has done regarding relativism and what we can cling to. The first one of these parables, which was the fifth parable in Matthew 13, was the parable of the treasure, God's glory hidden. In other words, Jesus came and revealed the glory of God and He gave His all to buy the field that the glory of God was in and because He loves you. And then He concealed the treasure of God's, God's glory from those who would have sold out to relativism and to religion. But He reveals God's glory to those who are discerning. And when He returns, God's glory will be unleashed on this world as the treasure it truly is. And then in the next parable, the parable of the pearl, we see God's grace available. As relativism attempts to eradicate truth, God will still pursue individuals so that He can pour His grace over whatever has wounded you, whatever has hurt you, whatever has brought pain into your life. And like an oyster, pours the substance over the grit that has wounded it to form the pearl. We are the pearl. Jesus pours His grace over us. We are His pearls of grace in the midst of an age that has lost all moralistic moorings, we find grace in Him and forgiveness and peace. And then finally, the parable of the net, we see God's timing 
perfect. God's timing perfect. The relativism that we're currently living in that marks the season of the return of Jesus is short-lived because the net of time is drawing us all toward the return of Jesus. When His truth will be the controlling factor, then those who know Him and embrace the truth will be divided from those who embraced the relativistic age. You see, after Jesus brought this to the mind of His disciples, He taught them something powerful. He told them in Matthew 24, verse 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, when you see relativism in the culture invading the church and causing a disregard for God's Word, you're living in the generation that will see His return. Jesus says, that is sure, because my words will not pass away. So, we see here that this death of normal as we know it is going to take place. And it will take place as relativism invades in the areas of truth, war, environment, and the church. And it will be so evident in every single thing that we see in the world around us. That brings me to the fifth area in which relativism will dominate. And this is the apex. This is the conclusion of the signs and the marks and the trends of the return of Jesus. But I want you to listen to me. Please hear what I'm going to say. I believe with all of my heart this area is the greatest indicator that we are right on the verge of the return of Jesus. The fifth area that relativism will attack, not only in the area of, of truth, of war, of the environment in the church, but in the area of mankind. Jesus says it this way, Matthew 24 and verse 36. He says, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah like? Well, he tells us in verse 38 that in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came, verse 39, and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. The flood ended life as it was known on earth. It was the death of normal. The flood was the death of normal. Why such a dramatic response to man's disobedience? Let's go back and see what the days of Noah were like, and we'll get an idea. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. We're filled with violence. And God saw that the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. But I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, the flesh or the very makeup of man was corrupted. The flesh of man, the makeup of man, who man is, was corrupted. And how was it corrupted? Well, it was corrupted because of them. Well, who is them? And who is the them that God says He's going to destroy? Well, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 says, When man began to multiply on the face of the earth, on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. In other words, what we have here are the sons of God. In the Hebrew, it's the Bene Elohim. Every time that Hebrew phrase is used, in the Bible, it refers to angelic beings. It, it's used in Job to refer to angelic beings presenting themselves before the Lord. But these angelic beings, these beings that are other than human, did something unbelievable. They bred with women. You, you see what he says here. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Well, the next verse gives an indication that these angelic beings were evil because it says that, in verse 3, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days are 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. 
You see those, that word Nephilim is also translated giants or fallen ones. They are the offspring of these demonic falling, fallen angels and the women which they accosted. And they were identified. Later it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when these angelic beings came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old who were men of renown. In other words, these were the men of whom legend was written. As a crossbreed between fallen angels and men, I believe what we have here is the biblical basis for mythology. Legends usually have some basic in, basis in fact somewhere. You can study ancient cultures that had absolutely zero contact with each other, and it is amazing the similarity between the mythological legends and creatures of those cultures that had no contact with each other. These legends and mythologies, I believe, grow out of the feats of these fallen ones, those who lived in the days of Noah just before the flood. This is the them God spoke of as to why <coughs> excuse me, he was going to destroy the world. The cohabitation of these fallen angels and women of the earth were Satan's attempt to so alter and, and corrupt the flesh of man, the lineage of man, the genome of man that it would have been impossible for Jesus to have been born. And man would have had no hope of a creator. You know, when Jesus completed his work on Calvary, he went to these creatures whose spirits were locked away and proclaimed victory. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 says, this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. In other words, Jesus died in the flesh. He was alive in the spirit. He went to that place where those spirits that died in the flood were incarcerated. And he proclaimed to them the victory. He descended to the place where these spirits of these creatures from the days of Noah were held and told them that they had been unsuccessful in changing the genome of man to keep him from coming. And where are these beings being held? Jude, chapter, Jude verses 6 through 7, And the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And of course that great day is the day of the great white throne judgment. But he says, until the judgment of that great day, now, now look at the comparison he uses. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise, just like those angelic beings, those demons that are locked away, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. In other words, these angelic beings, these demonic beings, did not stay in the state they were supposed to. They attacked the genome of man. They did everything they could to corrupt man's flesh. And in doing so, they were locked away until the judgment occurs at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And the scripture says in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. In other words, if God isn't going to spare those, those demons who did what they did, just be aware of the fact that if you choose to rebel against him, that you too are going to face judgment. And no, notice it says that these were cast into hell. That's not the usual word for hell, which is, which is the word Gehenna. This is the word Tartarus, which is known as the abyss or the pit or the deep. In other words, God says there's a brand of demon so vile that he's locked away. Now, there are certain demons that are free to serve Satan and to battle man, but these fallen angels and their offspring, the Nephilim, the, the mythological creatures, this, this breed that attempted to destroy the genome of man from the days of Noah are so vile they're locked away in a special pit, the abyss, and they're reserved in chains God prepared a special prison just for them. It's so vile 
that even those demons that are free to attack man don't want to be locked there. In fact, if you go to Luke chapter 8, as Jesus encountered a man who was so filled with demons that his name was Legion, as Jesus prepared to cast out those demons, they pleaded with him not to be cast into the abyss. That's in Luke 8 verse 31. While the days of Noah were certainly characterized by widespread disobedience and violence and rejection of God and the Holy Spirit, God chose to emphasize the interbreeding of fallen angels and women to produce this crossbreed race as the primary reason for the death of normal in the days of Noah and as the primary reason behind the flood. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them, the hybrid race. And behold, I will destroy them, that hybrid race, with the earth. Now with that in mind, I want you to look back at Jesus' word in Matthew 24, verse 37. For as the, were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now I want you to listen to me. Draw up close. Come on up here on the porch. Hear what I've got to say. Man is on the verge of having the scientific capability through genetic engineering and cloning to repeat the horror of the days of Noah. Man now has the capacity to alter DNA in organisms by removing or adding specific genes. I can give you the whole history of how that's happened. Since the mid-1970s, um, scientists have produced genetically altered microorganisms. In the 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that those organisms could be patented. The first successful alteration of a gene in a living organism in 1980 was in a mouse. Then, in 1982, they developed the eye color to change the eye color in fruit flies by altering the genetic makeup of the fruit flies. In 1982, the guidelines established by the National Institute of Health to govern genetic engineering were relaxed. In the 1980s, scientists began cloning frogs, take a cell from one frog and grow an entirely new frog from that cell. In 1993, we had the release of the movie Jurassic Park, which took mosquitoes embedded in amber and extracted the, the DNA from the blood of dinosaurs that those mosquitoes had bitten and reconstructed those dinosaurs through genetic engineering. We are now in the midst of an explosion of these types of situations. Cloning is no big deal now. Going all the way back to 1997, when a sheep named Dolly was cloned. And then on the heels of that, two Reese's monkeys were cloned. In 1998, cows were cloned. In fact, just last year, Barbara Streisand paid over $50,000 to have her beloved dog cloned. And so this cloning has exploded. But in light of all of this cloning that has taken place, now something even more dramatic is occurring. As there is actually a blending occurring of cells in embryonic form from organisms that are totally diverse genetically. These chimia or crimeas as they're called is a single organism that consists of genes from two separate and distinct genetic organisms and in vitro fertilization these embryos can be combined in an entirely different breed, different genetic animal, in fact, emerges. In 1984, um, a chimera sheep was grown to adulthood that was actually a combination of the genome of the sheep and the goat. It was a sheep goat, chimera. So, you know, in 2003, in the Shanghai Second Medical University, there was actually a fusion of the human cells from stem cells with a rabbit in a rabbit embryo in vitro fertilization, which resulted in a rabbit that had human skin. And even right now, just in recent days, Japan has approved 
genetic experimentation to occur to create a chimera between the hum a human embryo and a rhesus monkey. The only requirement they put on it was that they could not allow the embryo to come to full term. How long do you think that's going to last? Now there's also in China the attempt to use the pig embryo to grow human organs. They can take an embryo of a pig and extract the pig's heart stem cells, for example, and inject the human heart stem cells into the embryo. The pig grows, is growing to full term with a human heart rather than a pig heart. And what they're going to do is attempt to use those to harvest human organs for transplantation. As far as we know, and all I can say now is as far as we know, none have come to term. But folks, that's where we are. If God destroyed the world and it was the death of normal, when the human genome was altered before the flood, get ready. Jesus is coming soon. Here's your principle. As relativism increases, genetic engineering will be used to produce human-animal hybrids. You know, majority of people, because of relativism, will disregard all that is happening in the world around us. But I believe this experimentation with the human genome is the line in the sand. And that's why I say it is the apex, apex of everything. And why I believe with all my heart that Jesus is on the verge of coming back. He said it, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the time of the coming of the Son of Man. He is coming. And even though in the days of Noah they went about it life as usual, so what? This is happening. We have these mythological creatures or these creatures all around us. No big deal. So what? We have this human genome experimentation going on. We have this human genetic engineering taking place just as the attitude was in the days of Noah. Relativism is now the worldview. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Friend, you better be, because very soon that trumpet's gonna sound and the church is gonna be extracted. And if you don't know Jesus, you're gonna be left in a world where literally everything will unravel and the normal will be dead. If you've never made a surrender of your heart to Jesus Christ, there's no better time than right now and no better place than right here. Right now, would you just bow your head with me, please? Right now. And just pray this prayer. If you want to get this settled in your heart, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. The meaning of the door of your heart. If you open the door, I'll come in. Please, please don't delay. We're so close. Right now, just ask Him. He'll come in. Just pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I need you in my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And you've said that if I invite you, you will come into my heart. And right now, Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen, if you just prayed that prayer with me, and if you meant it with all your heart, I, I celebrate with you. I am so excited for you. Please, just, just go to the comment section down below the video there and just put in there, I prayed the prayer. And we'll get in touch with you. Uh, not, not to ask anything of you, uh, but just to help you know which steps to take next. Because we want to help you live these last days in concert with the one who loves you so much that he gave his life for you. Hey, look, glad to have you with us. Do me a favor. Take the, the uh, link for today's Porch Talk, drop it into your social media and share it with some folks. Just maybe there's somebody you know that could come to know Jesus personally as their Lord and Savior as well. Let me tell you how honored I am that you take time to just be on the porch with me to hear what we've got to say. Thank you so much. We're committed to sharing with you what God teaches us from His Word, and we're going to stay committed to that. Thank you again for being with us. Hey, I'm looking forward to seeing you again real soon 
right here on my porch. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.